So the title of our sermon, Poor Steward, A Poor Steward of Manifold Grace, Judges chapter 8, verses 22 to 35. So tonight now in Judges chapter 8, we complete our consideration of Gideon's tenure as judge over Israel. The nation of Israel had once again fallen into the sin of idolatry, doing evil in the sight of the Lord and worshiping the Baals. And so the Lord then delivered them into the hand of Midian under a devastating judgment for seven years. It's exactly what he told the Israelites he would do when they departed him and fell into idolatry. And so in desperation, the Israelites finally call on the Lord to deliver them out of the hands of the Midianite menace. And so the Lord raises up the fearful and faithless Gideon, and he goes to work on Gideon's faith. The Lord patiently, mercifully bolsters Gideon's faith through test and trial before then giving Gideon and a mere 300 men a tremendous victory over the armies of Midian in the valley of Jezreel. And as we've seen in working through the book of Judges now, the nation's physical oppression and the nation's physical warfare, they run parallel to an underlying spiritual oppression and an underlying spiritual warfare do their sin. The people faced, certainly faced devastating external physical circumstances. They faced death, hunger, despair, danger on every side. The people faced a devastating physical threat. The armies of Midian, the Amalekites, right? The people from the east. But they face an even more devastating and even more dangerous spiritual circumstance under the judgment of God. And they face, face an even more devastating spiritual threat, persistent, besetting, unrepentant, unforgiven sin, unforgiven idolatry. The external enemy that Israel faces in the Jezreel Valley is deadly, make no mistake about it. But the internal spiritual enemy that Israel faces is far more so. The same is true of you and I. You know, we don't face the same external enemies that Gideon and the nation of Israel, the armies faced. We don't fight the same external battles. We don't use the same external weapons. But we fight the very same enemies from within. Those enemies from within. We fight the same, very same spiritual warfare. All these things happen to them as examples to us. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right? They all happened for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages has come. And the example of Gideon and the nation of Israel, now that the Lord has delivered them from the hand of their external enemies, now that they have peace, as it were, on every side, uh, now that Gideon and the Israelites have won the physical battle, we now see Gideon and the nation falling apart at the seams over the spiritual battle, uh, losing the spiritual battle, losing in spiritual warfare. As we began to see last week in part one, there's this growing contention now in the heart of Israel, growing contention, and there's growing compromise in the heart of Gideon, growing compromise. They have proven to be poor stewards of God's grace. And that's where the lesson comes for us. We must not receive the grace of God in vain, Paul said, right? We must not be poor stewards of the manifold grace of God. We have to persevere in grace, rely on God for grace. We must stay the course. We have to persevere, perseverance in grace. Starting well must finish with or end up must be followed by finishing well. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So our text this evening begins now with a sham rejection and ends with a tragic relapse. Begins with a sham rejection and ends with a tragic relapse. Let's talk about the sham rejection. Look at verse 22 with me. Verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, you and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Gideon's done a good thing for the nation. Right? Gideon went to battle for the nation, fought off the armies of Midian, set the armies of Midian to flight. He has delivered Israel from the hand of Midian. And so the men of Israel now, 
mentioned here come to Gideon and ask him to rule over them. The men of Israel mentioned are likely the leaders of the tribes that he involved in the battle. We have the northern tribes and then Ephraim that he brings in later. So these men come to him and ask him to rule over them. Now notice, it's you, Gideon, who have delivered us, not the Lord having delivered us. They don't come to Gideon and say, Gideon, the Lord has given us a great victory over the Midianites. He has delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now seek the Lord, beseech the Lord what he would have us do. No, they don't do that, do they? Gideon, you have delivered us. You've delivered us from the hand of Midian. Rule over us. Rule over us, Gideon. They're not thinking biblically, right? They're not thinking biblically. How soon we forget (laughs) when your bank account has something in it, praise the Lord. (laughs) <laughs> when there's clothes on your back, food on your table, a roof over your head, praise the Lord. We tend to forget that we have all these blessings. They come from us by his hand. Right? We act often as though we hadn't received anything. When everything we've got, we've received from him. Right? They're not thinking biblically. They have forgotten the Lord. Remember chapter 7, verse 2. Chapter 7, verse 2, verse two the Lord reduced the army to a mere 300 men, lest they claim victory and glory for themselves against God, saying, my hand, the strength of my arm, has delivered me. Right? My own hand has saved me. And that was the, 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 the fear, the concern of chapter 7, verse 2. Now, they're obviously grateful to Gideon for leading, leading them in victory, and Gideon did lead them in victory. Obviously impressed with Gideon's newfound military skill, his military leadership and prowess, and so they offer Gideon and his descendants uh, that which is not theirs to offer. They offer him that which is unlawful for them to offer him. They may have been grateful, but what they're doing here, on top of being forgetful, on top of being neglectful, what they're doing here is unlawful. Gideon's response to their offer comes first in words and then in his action. We see what Gideon says and then we have to take note of what Gideon does, okay? So let's look at what Gideon says. Verse 23, so Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Gideon, that's good. (laughs) That's good, Gideon. A good outward confession. Gideon knows the law of God. This this is lining up with what the law of God clearly states. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, the law sets down the Lord's commands regarding the kings of Israel. Namely there, Deuteronomy 17 verse 15, the Lord says, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God is chooses. And then he breaks down the text. There are several commands there for those kings that the Lord himself places over Israel. In other words, Israel, you don't choose your king for yourself. These men come to Gideon and now they're offering something to Gideon that is not theirs to offer. They're offering something and what they offer is unlawful for them to offer. You're not to choose a king for yourself. Now remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8, rejecting a continuing succession of judges in Israel, and then rejecting the Lord ultimately to reign over them. The people begged God, right? Begged Samuel, give us a king. Give us a king like all of the nations to judge us like all the nations around us. And the Lord is then the one who gives them Saul. The Lord gives them Saul. So Gideon here, verse 22, rightly refuses. I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you, but the Lord shall rule over you. I could have added, he could have added in verse 23, uh, I didn't give you the victory, Israel. The Lord gave you the victory. Listen, we showed up with trumpets, pitchers, torches. The Lord was the one who gave us victory over 135,000 Midianites in the valley of Jezreel. So he stopped short of saying everything that he should But this is on the right track. In the beginning, Gideon says, I'm not going to do that. This is not lawful. This office, this title is not lawful for me to hold. The Lord has not given it to me. Now that's what Gideon says. That's what Gideon says. But what does Gideon then do? What does he do? Verse 24. Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. This in verse 24 is not as subtle as it may sound. 
Gideon, if you remember from last week, Gideon's been acting like a tyrant. He's, in, he's been acting like a tyrant, scourging, killing his own countrymen at Succoth and Penuel, carrying out his own personal ambitions, his own personal blood vengeance with the men that God had given him to lead. And now with the victory, he asks for an act of submission from these men. That's what it is. He asks for an act of submission, as if he's king. He asks for them to submit to him by giving him their plunder. Give me the share of your plunder. Now, Deuteronomy 17 also says that the king is not to multiply gold and silver to himself. The king is not to multiply gold and silver for himself. And that's the very first thing that Gideon here does. And what follows sounds like treasure fit for a king. Look at verse 25. They answered. Gideon gave them the victory, right? They answered, we'll gladly give them. So they spread out a garment. Each man threw into, into it earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments, the pendants, the purple robes, the kingly robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains, the kingly chains that were around their camel's necks. And what does Gideon do with it? Gideon sponsors a cult in Israel. He sets up cult worship in his hometown. Verse 27, then Gideon made it into an ephod, set it up in his city Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. When I hear this, verse 27, I can't help but think of Israel at Sinai, right? And Israel coming out of Egypt with great plunder, with great possessions. They go, God leads them into the wilderness, leads them to Mount Sinai. God is giving, them, giving Moses the law. What are the children of Israel doing with Aaron down in the valley below? They are throwing their earrings, their gold into the fire. Aaron says, look, pop, what popped out was this calf, this golden calf. They begin to worship, right? And they play the harlot there with this golden calf that Aaron fashioned from their earrings. We see Gideon repeating the same error here, right? Repeating the same error. Gideon had himself torn down the altar to Baal that was behind his father's house in Ophrah. That was one of the first things the Lord asked him to do. Go tear down that altar. Go tear down the wooden pole that's set up beside it. And now he fashions this exorbitantly expensive ephod and sets up Israel for again for idolatry. Now the priests in Israel, the priests wore an ephod. We're familiar with that garment from the Old Testament. The priests in Israel, God had them prepare an ephod. But the word for ephod was as well known in paganism, this word for ephod. And it described the garment that cults, cult worshipers would drape over objects of cultic worship. So an ephod was that garment garment in pagan, pagan religion that they would also drape over the object of worship in pagan idolatry. So Gideon wasn't walking around in the ephod. It's not like in the absence of um, a priesthood in Israel. And it's exactly what's happened, right? He's, Gideon hasn't hijacked the role of priest for himself. He's not walking around in this ephod. He obviously sets up an object of worship on which he drapes the ephod that he has made. And all Israel then is drawn to Ophrah to worship this idol that Gideon has set up. Do you see? It became a, a metonym, for example, a, a, a word that is a part for the whole, right? The, the ephod became a, a word that meant the idol, the object of worship that was included. Gideon has set himself up now, essentially as a cultic, cultic pagan king in Ophrah. Ophrah, his hometown as his capital, so to speak. And he's leading Israel into pagan idolatry, He does the people good, doesn't he, by obeying the Lord in fighting their external enemies. He does the people good by obeying the Lord into battle, right, and leading them into battle against Midian. But then he does the people immeasurable harm by causing them to fall on the sword of their own spiritual enemies. The people of Israel have been plagued with idolatry since they entered the land. The nations around them, they're Objects of worship have ensnared Israel. And here again, 
almost at the hand of Gideon, the nation of Israel is again falling on its sword over their spiritual enemy. Israel again plays the harlot. There was a time when there was no king in Israel and Gideon does what is right in his own eyes. So Gideon's original rejection of their offer to make him king in verse 22 is a complete sham. It's a complete sham. It's a sham rejection. He makes a good profession and then he doesn't follow that up with godly practice. He follows that up with the desires and the intentions of his own heart, his own ambitions. Now listen, this is the very same damning error that professing Christians make today. Same error, just flavored a little differently, dressed up a little differently. They profess, they make a good profession, right? They profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They profess to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they do not know the word of God. They do not obey the word of God. They do not follow him as Lord. They don't worship him as he has called them to worship him. They make a good profession and they may have a zeal, but they have a zeal for God that is not according to knowledge. And the pagan ephod that they have set up for themselves, that they believe is an object of worship, this pagan ephod becomes a snare to them. Now that pagan idol may be any number of things. When you think about all the pagan idols that we fabricate, that we set up today before we come to the true and living God of the Bible, before we turn from idols to serve the living and true God, right? That pagan idol, that pagan ephod may be a false conception of the love of God that is not concerned at all with obedience to his commands. Right? There are people worshiping at the cult off altar of that idol all over the place today, right? They have a conception of the love of God, and that conception of the love of God has nothing to do with the love of God that we see in the Bible, a love that adores his word, a love that hungers and thirsts for righteousness, a love, a fruit of the spirit that produces holiness of life, right? They have no concept of that love. And what they've done is they've set up this pagan, cultic, ephod that they label the love of God. They believe that they're worshiping him in the way that they've called him to worship him. And yet they're worshiping some idolatrous understanding of him. It's the same thing. It's dressed up in different garb. Do you see? It may have the same, what they believe to be the same object, or it may be the same concept, right? But it's dressed up in pagan idolatrous garb. It's dressed up in worldliness, right? We see false worship, all over the place today, all over the place, there's false worship, people worshiping the true and living God in ways that he would consider to be strange fire, right? That he burnt up the sons of Aaron for doing, and yet they come to this ephod of their own making. They come to this ephod, this cult object of their own making, and they worship at that altar, believing they're worshiping God, and yet they're in idolatry. It's become a snare to them. A pagan ephod may be charismatic experience, experience uh, wrapped up and hyped up in worldly forms of worship. Worship that merely affects or impacts the senses of the worshiper, but does not bear the fruit of holiness, does not bear the fruit of love and devotion to God. All it does is hype up the senses and the feelings of the worshiper. That is a pagan cult ephod that's been erected in our culture today, right? It's not God's worship. It may be your own free will. Maybe you think you've uh, made a decision. I follow him. But when you say I follow him, to you, you're following him exclusively on your own terms. What you've done is you've set up a cultic ephod. I believe in Jesus Christ, or I follow the God of the Bible, but what you've done is you're following him now on your own terms. Not the terms of what God has set down in his word. You're following him the way that you see fit, the way that you've conceived in your head to be right, and what you've done for yourself now because you have not submitted to the God of the Bible is that you've set up now a cultic, pagan ephod, and you're playing the whore with it. You're playing the harlot with it. And God says that is not acceptable worship. That is paganism. That is idolatry. We've got to be so careful. You see how, what a blessedness the word of God is. 
God has spoken. God has revealed himself. He has revealed the way in which he is to be worshipped. And we are to worship him the way that he's called us to worship him. And listen, that is the joy and rejoicing of God's people. That is a blessed worship. That's a, a cause for rejoicing. The people of God love to worship him in the way that God has called them to worship. Why? Because it's good, right? Worship God in the beauty of holiness. Why would he say that? Because it's beautiful. It's glorious. It's cause for rejoicing. That's the way to, we're, we're to worship God. Gideon doesn't do that, right? Gideon doesn't do that. Gideon goes and he sets up this ephod. It's just, oh, Gideon, right? You just, uh. Gideon makes a good profession, but that profession doesn't line up with Gideon's practice. So his profession then, then is a sham. His profession is a sham. The Lord says, the Lord Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That should cause a holy fear in us to cling to that which he has commanded us, to cling to his word. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who calls me Lord, Today, you've got people all over our country, all over the world, who would say, no, I don't believe in the lordship of Jesus Christ, right? They don't even hold to that. But there are many who call him Lord, who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But it's he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's the one who shall enter. James says that professing Christians deceive themselves by words without actions, essentially, right? They deceive themselves by words without action. They hear, but they do not do. Do yourself a favor for a minute. If you're listening from home, listen. Do yourself a favor. Don't focus merely on what you say you believe. Don't focus on what you say you believe. Focus on the fruit of that profession. Focus on the fruit don't deceive yourself with a sham profession. What is the fruit of that profession? What is the fruit of your practice? What does your life look like? Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me and therefore does not abide fruit, does not bear fruit, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. Do yourself a favor and don't focus merely on what you say. Focus on the fruit of your profession, the fruit of your practice. So Gideon says one thing and he does another. It's the definition of hypocrisy, right? His actions bear bitter, bitter fruit. He leads the nation back into idolatry. And not one time in the book of Judges do we see a functioning priesthood in Israel. Have you noticed that? Through the book of Judges, not one time do we see a functioning priesthood the way that God intended for the priesthood to function. And yet Gideon sets up this ephod, right? An object of idolatry in Ophrah and then leads the people into harlotry against their God. And after a tremendous deliverance, right, a tremendous deliverance that had, given, had been given them by the gracious hand of God. So the defeat of the Midianites then is summarized by this statement in verse 28. Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. No song like that of Deborah to celebrate the Lord's victory, what the Lord has done. They lifted their heads no more. They lifted their heads to him no more. They had peace for 40 years. Brothers and sisters, I would submit that we must lift our heads to him as much in peace as we do in adversity. We must be constantly lifting our eyes to him, constantly uh, let us lift our heads to him as much now in peace as we do in adversity. In the verses that follow, we see all the indications that Gideon is acting now like a renegade king, 
All the indications that he's a renegade king. Verse 29, and Jerobe- Jerobeel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt. The word literally, therefore dwelt, literally means sits. So it's not just that he dwells in his house, he sits in his house. It's like he's sitting as king, right? He sits in his house as king. Jerobeel, the son of Joash, went and sits in his own house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. Another prohibition for the kings from Deuteronomy chapter 17. They're not to multiply wives to themselves, which many kings did. And it's another indication here that Gideon is acting like a pagan king. He's practically setting up for himself a dynasty. It's interesting, the parallel. The Canaanite god, who is also called El, the Canaanite god, who El and Baal are thought to be the same person, or it's that El and Asherah get married, and Baal is one of their offspring. There are two different views of that. But the Canaanite god El, that pagan god El, and his wife Asherah had 70 sons. So I think it's possible that it's a stylized number here that Gideon himself, in comparison with the Canaanite god El, Gideon himself has 70 sons. We know that for certain, but it's interesting to think about. Verse 31, his concubine, Gideon, his concubine who was in Shechem. Now, if she was in Shechem, she was a Canaanite. She was a Shechemite. That was supposed to be off limits. The Shechemites, the Canaanites, were under the ban. His concubine who was in Shechem, a Shechemite, also bore him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age, was buried in the tomb of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Now we'll consider the exploits of Abimelech next Sunday evening. But it's worth noting here the meaning of his name. One, Abimelech is typically or primarily a Philistine name. We don't see an Israelite named Abimelech in the Bible. It's typically a Philistine name rather than an Israelite name. That's interesting, isn't it? Gideon would name his son, give his son a Philistine name. Secondly, what does Abimelech mean? The word Abimelech means the king is my father. (laughs) The king is my father. Gideon, right? I'll not rule over you, nor shall my son. The Lord will rule over you. Good profession, Gideon. What does he name his son? The son of a Shechemite. He names him Abimelech. My father is the king. He professed God as king in verse 23. Now he's obviously not acting like it, right? He tears down the altar of Baal in his own hometown. Now he has succeeded in undoing all the good that he's done for Israel. He may have rescued them out from under the hand of Midian. Now he's put them under an even more oppressive, a more dangerous, a more deadly spiritual uh, idolatry, spiritual enemy. And Gideon hasn't finished well. We must finish well. We have to finish well. Having been witness to Gideon's sham rejection, now what do we see in Israel? We see a tragic relapse, a tragic relapse. Verse 33, so it was that as soon as Gideon was dead, it's interesting that it's as soon as Gideon was dead. It's as if Gideon still has some kind of restraining influence on the wickedness of the people, even though Gideon does these things. I believe that's just maybe the Lord restraining them more so than Gideon. Maybe restraining them for the sake of Gideon and what Gideon had done. It was as soon as Gideon was dead, verse 33, that the children of Israel again again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal bear it, their God. They keep going back to their vomit. Right? Thus the children of Israel, verse 34, did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. The three elements given here that describe the degeneracy of the people, the depravity of the people. One, they played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal bear it, their God. Amazing, isn't it? No time at all passes, not even a full generation passes before they're right back into the idolatry that put them under the hand of Midian in the first place, right? Chop off your hand. You go to the doctor. Say, it hurts. The doctor says, don't do it. You go home, you chop off the other hand. <laughs> That's what, I, it, it's senseless. Absolutely senseless. And yet they're back playing the harlot with the bales again. After God 
in miraculous fashion, gave them this overwhelming victory that was obviously at the hand of God. After they had been put in oppression under the hand of Midian, which was obviously an act of God's judgment against them for their sin of idolatry. It's amazing, right, how thick-headed, how stiff-necked, how rebellious we are apart from the grace of God in Christ, right? They play the harlot with the bales. Two, Israel forgot the true and living God. Verse 34, the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of... It doesn't mean that they didn't have that in their memory. They certainly did. They had that in their writings. They had that in their history. They know what God had done for Israel. Right? Remember when the Lord came to Gideon. Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press because he's fearful of the Midianites, God comes to him there. The angel of the Lord comes to him, says, you mighty man of valor, right? He's threshing wheat in the wine press. And what does Gideon say back to him? You know, if God is with us, then where's, what, what's he done for us lately, right? The, the, the works that God did for our fathers in Egypt, like Gideon remembers what the Lord had, he recounts to the angel of the Lord what God had done for Israel, for their fathers when he rescued them out of Egypt with a strong hand. They know, they know. So what does it mean that they forgot the true and living God? This wasn't a short-term memory problem, right? They refused to acknowledge God's salvation. They refused to submit themselves under the implications of that deliverance. That's what it means that they forgot their God. They knew that God had delivered them. God had given them a mighty victory. They recognized that. They refused to submit themselves to it. If I acknowledge that God has given us the victory, well, then I have to worship him. And what do I want to do? I want to worship this pagan fertility cult over here where I can have relations with pagan cult prostitutes at the door of the pagan temple, right? I want this kind of lifestyle for myself. I want to do as I please. There's no king in Israel. I'll not have that man to rule over me. I'm going to do what's right in my own eyes. That's what their thought. That's what it means to forget the Lord your God. I'm going to live for myself. What does it mean when you turn to live for yourself? It means you forget who God is is over you, right? You forget what God has done. God has given you life. God has given you breath. God has given you everything that you have. It wasn't a short-term memory problem. They forgot the true and living God. They fail to respond accordingly or biblically or repentantly or lovingly. Third, they were ultimately ungrateful in their actions toward Gideon. What God had done for them wasn't enough to compel their devotion. And what a sad, sad, tragic testimony that is. God delivers them, he saves them. But what God had done for them in saving their very lives. Now think with me for a moment, think. Under Midian, they're starving to death. Starving, hiding out in hills and caves, right? Running for their lives. Many of them, including uh, Gideon's own household, were murdered by these, this Midianite menace. So they're under severe oppression, severe oppression. God delivers them in mercy and grace. They don't deserve it. They deserve none of it. Just out of covenant, loving kindness, God's patience, grace, and mercy, he raises up a judge and he saves them out from under the hand of Midian. Now they have peace all around on every side. They've been rescued, delivered from the hand of their enemies. Peace for 40 years. And what God did for them isn't enough to compel their love to him? What God did for them isn't enough to compel their devotion? Is it enough to compel their commitment? Right? Paul says of his service to the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14, it's the love of Christ that compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. We need to think, brothers and sisters, right, what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me, what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. If the love of the Lord Jesus Christ can't compel you to put your faith and trust in him, to turn from your sin and to serve him with heart devotion, then heaven help you because no one else can. The Lord Jesus Christ is the savior of men. 
The love of Christ has come. He has given himself on the cross. He has died for sinners. Himself paid the penalty for their sin. The wrath that they justly deserved was poured out upon him. And if that love poured out on the cross by Jesus Christ is unable to compel you, it just magnifies how depraved your heart and mind really are. Right? Doesn't it magnify the depravity of man that that love, that mercy, that grace does not compel us to live heart, soul, mind, and strength for him, right? What God has done isn't enough to compel their devotion, their commitment, their love, their remembrance. Not even compelling enough for them to remember the Lord, to acknowledge him. We must, we must cons consider the love of the Lord Jesus Christ toward us and devote ourselves, devote our heart, soul, mind, and strength to him, right? He is worthy. He's worthy of those acts of praise and that, that life of service. God, help me, help you, help us to live a life devoted to him. I always, when I think about that, you know, come back to the example of Mary, and she's in the house, and it's shortly before the Lord would go to the cross to die. And she comes to the Lord with her prized possession, this alabaster flask of oil. And she doesn't just, you know, take off the cap and drivel a little bit in her hand and, you know, and anoint the head of Jesus. She breaks open the flask, costly oil. It makes Judas irate. Look how expensive that was. We could have given all that money to the poor, Right? Well, Mary pours it all out on the Lord Jesus Christ as an act of devotion, right? The fragrance, the fragrance of that act fills the house. Lord, may the fragrance of our devotion fill this house. May the fragrance of our devotion to you for all that you've done for us, may it fill this community, right? Fill this area, fill this town. May it fill the world. And one day it will. The contention that we note in the heart of Israel will continue to grow like a cancer. It's going to grow like a cancer. Their relapse will soon result once again in divine retribution. So we've seen in that common pattern throughout the book of Judges. And as with those who came before, Gideon would prove not to be the mighty savior warrior judge who would crush the head of the serpent. He would merely be one in a line that would point forward to him. And frankly, one that makes us long for the one that would come, right? Uh, that makes us rejoice that he has come. Um, he's one of those. So how about you tonight? How about you? Are you running well? Are you running well? Listen, prepare to finish well. Don't stop running. Don't stop running the race. Um, let loose of the sin which so easily ensnares us and run the race. Don't stop. Don't stop. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Is your heart and your practice in accord with your profession? Is what you do and what you say, what you say and what you do, does it line up, right? Like Israel or like Israel, do you find yourself only calling upon him when you're in need, when it gets bad enough? Have you forgotten him? Do you fail to acknowledge him for all the good that he's done to you? Does not his great love, his great sacrifice, does it not move you? If you find yourself this evening cold, indifferent, unmoved in consideration of these things, then repent of your sin. It is an indication of a heart cancer, a heart gangrene that will certainly kill you in the end if you don't turn from it, right? Repent, believe in the gospel, put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him with all your heart. He is worthy of such devotion. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We love you. We, we're grateful to you, Lord, for sending your only begotten son into the world in great love that those who would turn from their sin and put their faith in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We 
praise you for this unspeakable gift, this immeasurable love, this, this indescribable and bountiful grace and mercy toward us who are sinners and depraved and forgetful and indifferent and hard-hearted and stiff-necked and prone to wander and idolatrous. And Lord, we are in such great need of your mercy such great need of your grace. Please, Lord, we pray, pour it out on us. Pour it out on this church. Help us to be faithful, devoted people, a people marked by a high commitment, devotion to you, love for you, the love of Christ compelling us to press on in this life. And may you be honored. May you be magnified. May the world see it and glorify your name in the day of visitation. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us. May you be blessed forever, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.